Okay? Please. Uh, I have two questions. <laughs> One of them may be very practical, but the question is, you said that diet for mice, it's regarding the third part. Yeah. Uh, it's very expensive. So the question is, how expensive will be that pills or wherever for human beings? Yeah, okay, so that's a, that's a great question. If you go to a fine chemical company to buy deuterated compounds, mostly that are being used as mass spectrometry standards or um, um, NMR standards, you, you, you could be paying thousands of dollars a gram. Okay. We've scaled up the synthesis as an industrial product. Okay. And I think, um, if I remember right, our, uh, for our clinical trials, feeding people, with the current scale of manufacture, uh, we're anticipating costs something like $10 a day. It's, it's manageable. Okay. And we think we can get the cost down by another factor of 10 uh, once the stuff's being made in tons. Okay. It's not bad. Just bad when you start with research reagents. Okay. Um, and second question probably won't be naive, but uh, you said that when we take, like, it's in the first part of your talk, when we took uh, culture cells, and there's actually a mixture, not just one cell, uh, and the question is, is it because they originate, the origin was a uh, mixture of cells, okay. or they somehow generate to the right. process? So, um, that's actually a terrifically good question. And it doesn't have a simple, straightforward answer. But I'll give you the simplest answer I can. If you grow bacteria in the laboratory, you can start with single cells. And they will propagate. So in principle, a bacterial culture could be a pure homogeneous culture. All the cells are progeny from a single cell. So as long as they're not mutating fast, they should all be the same. And much of our historic molecular biology is based on this. But most of the time when you grow mammalian cells, you're not starting with single cells. You have a culture, and you're taking a small part of it, and you're diluting it up, and you're, pa you're passaging it, okay? And if you put a single mammalian cell in a huge culture plate, it'll, I, I think often it sounds like company, and they just, you know, it's not going to grow, okay? So it exacerbates the problem of heterogeneity, because we culture cells by dilution and not by single cell. Plane, usually. But if you have a sufficiently high mutation rate, then by the time you go from one cell to ten to the six cells, you can have a mixture again. But in this case, what about the injection of the same cells in the human being? Well, that's a real problem. <laughs> okay, I, I think that uh, you know people who think have been thinking about this have not been paying enough attention to the fact that real-life cell cultures are heterogeneous. Okay? It doesn't mean that that heterogeneity is lethal, but it means you better understand it. There's obviously going to be benign heterogeneity and malignant heterogeneity. Okay? And we have to make sure that the, that the actual heterogeneity is, is uh, uh, benign. And people just haven't paid attention to this, but, but they have to. Thank you. I have a question about um, suicide pill for tumor cells. Uh, so, as you said, uh, we can take a toxic protein and divide it into two parts, and then put in the cells we've uh, grown up in the, the lab. And then put these cells in the body and to wait for this protein to work, right? But then uh, the cell, they, this, these cells, they uh, begin to divide, right? And it may happen that uh, there, there, there would be no toxic protein in the um, uh, second generation or third generation cells, so it may not work out. Okay, for, uh, right. So, uh, again, I, that's a great question, and it shows that I forgot to say something too. Okay. We are not just putting this construct into cells. We are genetically engineering this construct into the cells. So the cells inherit this suicide pill. Okay? Yeah, 
Okay. Hello. I have one question about the first part. Wait, talking to the mic, please. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have one question about the first part of the lecture. Uh, uh, you said that uh, the uh, tumor cells have resi uh, make resistance. How? Uh, when they? When do they form resistance? Okay. So, and so uh, yeah. Again, that's actually that's a very sophisticated question. Okay, as it turns out. And uh, it's the current subject of a lot of active research. And um, what's disturbing, I showed you the T790M, the famous lung cancer case. What's disturbing is that a lot of treatment naive patients, patients who have not been treated, have that mutant already. And we don't understand what it's doing there. That's, that's, that doesn't bode well uh, for our chances of getting control of the situation. Okay. So it's not a complete answer to your question, but I mean, it really, okay, it, it shows that it's an issue. Yeah. Уважаемые uh, чарни, спасибо большое за лекцию. Я хотел несколько слов сказать, может быть, задать вам вопрос. Вот последняя часть, касающаяся Влияние антиоксидантов и использование гейфелия. Я, может быть, громко буду говорить. Давайте второй микрофон. Я буду переводить сейчас. Да. А... Касающиеся гейфелия или тяжелой воды, так называемой, введенной в, в комбинацию с кислотой. Это история очень интересная. Вот когда случился Чернобыль, и в Чернобыле было действие радионуклеидов, которые поступали с продуктами питания. И были целый ряд изменений очень интересных у людей, связанных с воздействием на геном, все ряды свободно-радикальных механизмов. Мы имеем в России ну, прекрасную школу людей, которые работают в области свободных радикалов, возглавляемую академиком Владимиром. Кто, может быть, слышал такого человека? Он работает в нашем so Charles, basically the uh, question per pertains to the last part of your talk uh, regarding the isotopic stabilization of uh, organic compounds with deuterium. So um, Alexander Gregorovich uh, um, uh, points to the fact that after the Chernobyl event, uh, when there was a lot of radiation released into the environment, uh, uh, we've uh, started observing a lot of effects uh, uh, pertaining to the DNA damage uh, with oxidative stress, or oxidative stress. And there are lots of experts in Russia, including uh, academic uh, Vladimirov, um, uh, studying those effects in uh, humans. Интересно то, что оказалось, что в основе всех воздействий на здоровье человека в данном случае было связано с радиолизом воды. Именно радиолиз воды вызывал э, появление свободных радикалов в клетках, которые оказывают повреждающие действия. Я это, рас... uh... да, я это рассказываю, Александр Александрович, я это рассказываю только потому, что становится понятно, почему введение гейтерии в состав антиоксиданта э, позволяет оказать эффект. Это абсолютно точно. У нас есть по этому поводу публикации и работы, которые вошли в аналы so one of the sources of oxidative stress was the radiolysis of water uh, with radiation. Uh, and uh, uh, it basically uh, explains why including uh, deuterated um, uh, organic compounds uh, into the um, uh, living systems may have radioprotective effects. Uh, I, I completely agree. I, I mean, that's actually, it's an angle that we've, we've thought about uh, a lot, that uh, um, if you could afford to live on a diet that had a lot of uh, covalently attached deuterium, uh, you would probably be protected against radiation. Yeah, I can go further just briefly. The, the, the um, Misha Shepinov, it is very interested in the possibility of protecting DNA against 
radiation damage. Because um, uh, you, you might ask, why haven't we sent an astronaut or a cosmonaut to Mars? Why hasn't anybody done that? And the answer is they'll die from the radiation before they get there, right? So before we send people to other planets, we have to have a way of protecting them from the radiation flux in outer space, either by having a much heavier uh, lead in case spacecraft or by changing their diet in some way to give them radiation protection. And, and Nisha is actually very interested in trying some data experiments. Я хочу еще сказать об одном очень интересном примере. Мы здесь, в России, в нашем центре, сконцентрировали пациентов с алимией фанфоти. Есть такое заболевание, не для медиков, я скажу, что это заболевание, связанное с нестабильностью генома. И эти пациенты, они в течение жизни имеют стойкие нарушения прогрессирующих генома, которые приводят их или к развитию э, депрессии кровотворения, апластической аминии, как называется заболевание, или к опухоли. И эти больные все погибают. So here at this center uh, we aggregate the patients with the Fanconi anemia. It's a genetic disease uh, which is uh, uh, characterized by very high level of uh, genetic instability. Uh, leading to either uh, uh, hematologic disorders uh, or cancer. В это время у нас было такой период увлечения свободно радикальным механизмом окисления попытками регулировать его. Казалось, что рутин в очень высоких дозах, в дозах в тысячу раз превышающих терапевтические дозы, способен быть мощнейшим антиоксидантом, который блокирует свободно радикальный uh, so here we looked at various ways to combat oxidative stress and uh, one of the uh, methods for combating oxidative stress was routine and it showed uh, effects uh, in high doses uh, uh, to protect against oxidative stress uh, at the center. И была больная с анемией Фанкони, которая имела тяжелую аплазию, была у нее удалена селезенка она получала специальную химиотерапию без эффекта и в конце концов ей дали рутин и потом стали ее наблюдать и она полностью восстановила свое кровотворение спустя год выросла и вообще стала абсолютно адекватным человеком so we had a very complex patient female patient uh, here at the center with Fanconi with Fanconi anemia um, who uh, um, was developing uh, the disease and uh, uh, had the splenectomy, uh, uh, the spleen removed, uh, went through several medical procedures uh, and did not respond. But uh, uh, they basically uh, prescribed, uh, used the routine, the antioxidant, and uh, uh, which led to a very good recovery. The child got about 1,000 milligrams, gram routine, Ну, чтобы было просто понятно, дозовая нагрузка. Интересно, интересно что э, мы опубликовали эту работу, она вызвала большой интерес. Приехала группа э, Европейского общества Фанкони, пригласили наших специалистов, они до сих пор в Италии работают, они не вернулись. Значит, они уехали работать в Италию для того, чтобы работать с этим обществом. Оказалось, что только треть пациентов с Фанкони имеет механизм блокирования возможности блокирования антиоксидантами. Две трети пациенты с конечным эффектом тем же имели совсем другие пути ну, метаболизма, которые, по-видимому, пока не изучены. So basically, uh, well, firstly, the patient was treated with about a gram of uh, routine a day uh, to recover. And uh, they published this work in a peer-reviewed journal, and that uh, uh, triggered a very interesting, uh, a lot, lot of interest in the industry. Uh, and um, a delegation from the Fanconia, uh, Fanconia Anemia Association uh, came here to investigate what's happening. Uh, took several patients from uh, this center uh, back to Italy. Uh, they never returned, and um, uh, they've con uh, they've conducted uh, additional studies and noticed that about uh, a third of the patients 
uh, is very responsive to antioxidant treatment. Uh, about two, third, uh, two thirds have various dif uh, different pathways uh, for disease prog progression where antioxidant ther therapy did not work. Uh, я хотел привести этот пример для того, чтобы показать, что простые достаточно вещи, такие рутины, это витамин, один из витаминов, способны вызвать стабилизацию генома у пациента, у которого имеется генетические нарушения. То есть мы проследили в течение длительного времени эту пациентку, и у нее произошли существенные, в тысячу раз меньше поломки генома в конечном итоге после появления антиоксидантов. Поэтому то, то вещество, которое сейчас испытываются в рамках антиоксидантной защиты очень интересно, очень интересно. Uh, so basically this example was given to uh, in, in order to demonstrate that sometimes very simple compounds, uh, very basic like protein as vitamin, uh, may act uh, um, as uh, the suppressors for uh, uh, genome uh, instability. Uh, basically. Uh, Zero protectors and protectors against uh, uh, increased genome instability. Uh, and here it is uh, possible that uh, the compounds that are isotopically um, fortified uh, may have action in the uh, in various diseases. Maybe it may be very high potential uh, drug. So we do have actual uh, human models. So Fanconia anemia, just think about it. Yeah, I, don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know much about Fanconia anemia. You have to tell me more. There's the least few of you. So we're waiting for your compounds. Okay, sounds good. So uh, any other questions? Uh, uh, thank you very much for brilliant uh, lecture. Uh, would you go back uh, to G4 system? I have two questions uh, okay. with respect to it. First of all, how did you deliver uh, components of uh, G3 or G4 system to target cells? Was it transfection? Yeah, so uh, I, I, I skipped over that, but yes, all of these, uh, all of these, uh, all of the components are uh, coded on plasma. And so we, we can either transiently <coughs> transfect or we can stably transfect. So this is a, the, the whole system is completely biosynthetic. Okay, uh, so how did you prove uh, that uh, transfection itself uh, do not influence on the level of the transcript of interest? It's biochemistry of uh, uh, metabolism uh, and so on. Right, okay, so uh, obviously um, transfection does perturb the cells. Uh, that's the problem with uh, any transient transfection. And, uh, but uh, one of the ways uh, that we can be confident that uh, what we're seeing is real is that we have a vast number of controls in which we alter or delete one of the components, okay? The nice thing about a four-component system is you can leave any one out and the system should fail. And it does. Okay. So the transfection is the same. We're just either adding one less component or one wrong component. Okay? But it's not absolute because it's almost a circular problem. Okay? I need a way of observing things in living cells that's not perturbing in order to study whether or not something else is perturbing, okay? So, for example, if we perform a direct uh, in situ hybridization, uh, we will observe uh, uh, appropriate genes. But if well, we... Uh, yeah, okay. So, so we, we, of course, we can use, uh, we don't do in situ hybridization, but we can use PCR uh, to independently quantify um, the level of transfer. And of course we do that, okay? But that's not a dead cell. Mm -hmm. Okay, and <laughs> second uh, thing. Uh, as uh, I understood, uh, you proposed that uh, G4 system could be used uh, in vivo, for example, for searching for tumor cells. Uh, how will you plan to deliver all components of this system uh, to 
target cells. How will uh, uh, the components of G4 system find appropriate cells? Okay, uh, right. Cells right. this uh, okay. take its Okay, so, so, so that's a great question. And, and uh, what, when we originally conceived the G4 system, the problem we were actually interested in was certain childhood leukemias. <laughs> right? uh, AML, ALL, and so on. Okay? And we were wondering, those cells have an inappropriate transfer. And we were wondering if we could treat a patient uh, with this system, uh, if it got into a normal cell, it wouldn't do anything. But if it got into a, a leukemia cell, it would kill it. That was the original concept behind the whole company. And that's not going to work. It's not going to work because you just can't get transfection anywhere near the efficiency that's required. Okay? So that approach fails completely. So the way I see this working is only in the context of cell therapy. Okay? I'm going to have cells in vitro in that case, I can engineer and select or sort for cells that are properly engineered and then put them back. Okay? That's the only way this is going to work. And all of our thinking now is in the context of cell therapy. Okay? I would like to uh, ask a question. Uh, uh, you know that uh, some uh, bioactive uh, lipid products uh, are derivated from uh, are derivated from essential uh, fatty acids. Uh, its uh, synthesis uh, means uh, the oxidation of uh, of uh, these essential fatty acids. So uh, the question is: uh, Are there any differences uh, between? Uh, between native uh, essential uh, acids uh, with uh, hydrogen or and uh, and uh, uh, deuterated uh, fatty acids in the signalization in the function. Right. Okay. So so the, the um, it's a very hard question um, to answer experimentally. Because the major tool that we have to look at um, fatty acid metabolism is to use deuterium compounds as tracers, okay? So by the very nature of that experiment, you're making the assumption that by putting the deuterium in as a tracer, you're not altering the metabolic pathways, okay? Now, the experiment I can do that gets towards the point you are raising is to use C13 instead of deuterium. Because now I have something that chemically is just absolutely not going to perturb anything. But I still have a molecular weight shift that lets me follow the tracer metabolically. Okay? And I don't actually know the extent to which uh, somebody probably knows, but I don't know. The extent to which C13 metabolic tracers have been done with essential fatty acids and whether those results match the deuterium results. I think people mostly do deuterium because it's so much cheaper. Okay. 